a piece, a sill, S-I-L-L, 78 inches. This week on Kentucky Field, we're getting up close and personal with the state's only flying mammal, but not for fun. We're doing it to try to save an endangered species. Next. We can use it on about any tree, uh, but that one I believe looks perfect, Chad. We'll explore something that's getting a lot of interest these days. It allows me to ascend up, I release the tension on it, and I'm going to descend. Okay. okay. And that's tree saddle hunting. I could shoot here, I can come out on the stick, shoot over here. Then, <coughs> we're going to take to the woods for some squirrel hunting. <coughs> it's all next on Kentucky <coughs> Afield. <coughs> It's a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we have many wildlife biologists that work on the animals we hunt and the fish that we fish for but there are a small group of biologists that work to monitor and protect endangered species. Virginia big-eared bats are our most endangered mammal we have in Kentucky. As best we can tell from the information we have available to us, um, statewide there's only somewhere between three and 4,000 individuals currently. The biologists here at Kentucky Fish and Wildlife spend a lot of time managing Virginia big-eared bats. So last year, as a part of our project with Virginia big-eared bats, we discovered a new, or at least newly known to us, maternity site for the species. It's a pretty sizable site. It holds maybe a little bit over 10% of all the Virginia big-eared bats we know of in the state. We were concerned that people could unknowingly go into the cave at the wrong time of year and disturb the bats and actually cause the population to decline. So at that point, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife worked with the Daniel Boone National Forest, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, with the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust, and with uh, experts in actually erecting these cave gates to get the site protected using, using a cave gate. Uh, I need a piece, a sill, S-I-L-L, 78 inches. Yes. When I say gated, we're erecting these barriers that will allow the bat to move in and out of the cave freely, but that restricts human access. Human disturbance, and most of the time it's uh, unknowingly disturbing these bats, can actually have a negative impact on the population. So if we get a lot of human disturbance at a cave that's used as a hibernaculum, for example, while the bats are hibernating, the humans walking around will disturb them, they'll wake up, they'll start depleting fat reserves, and they'll actually starve to death in the wintertime. In the summertime, if it's a maternity site for a species, you disturb the mothers with their pups. Sometimes the pups, if you do it the wrong time of year, are unable to fly at this time, and they can actually fall down to the cave floor to their death. So when we put these cave uh, gates up or barriers up, it's there as a way of managing uh, a very small number of the caves that we have in the state that that are the ones that are our most important cave resources. We utilized our Kentucky Wild program to pay for a portion of the gate. And in conjunction with that, the Imperiled Bat Conservation Fund administered by the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust paid for a portion of the project as well. So we were able to leverage Kentucky Wild funds that are donated monies from our Kentucky Wild members to actually get this site protected. What we want to do is put in these management strategies with uh, putting cave gates up 
but then we also want to continue monitoring the sites to make sure that the populations are at least holding steady, although we would obviously prefer to have the, the populations increase in size. A tool that we use for monitoring populations, we can go in with thermal binoculars and monitor emergence at night and just get a count of how many bats are coming out. In order to collect the most data from a site and to really see how a population is doing, we'll use a harp trap. A harp trap is a metal frame with monofilament fishing line that you'd buy at any bait store strung vertically. And the idea is as the bats emerge out of the cave, they kind of bump into the fishing line that we've got pulled real tight and it makes them fall into a little cloth bag at the bottom of the trap. As soon as they hit the bag at the bottom, we have biologists on site that pull the bat out and that's when we really start collecting some good information on is this a site used by males or females, sometimes both? Is it a maternity site where we have both mothers and pups there? What's the reproductive condition and the body condition of the bats that we're catching? And that's where we're also able to uh, put bands on bats so we can do these long-term data sets. That's essentially a way of marking the bat so that we can collect trend data on individuals. We're able to band these bats in the summertime We'll go in in the winter time to do the bat counts, and as we see bats that have a band on them, we'll pull that bat, look at the band, report that, and we're able to find migration trends on species. So by attaching these bands, we're able to start getting these links between where they're spending their summers and where they're spending their winters. In addition, we're able to look year after year and see how long some of these bats live, which can actually be up to 20 years. So by not only doing the monitoring that we've talked about, but by also installing these cave gates at appropriate sites, we're able to monitor and hopefully recover the species long term. One of the things we want to make sure of is to protect the populations that we know of and then beyond that, once we get these sites protected, then we can work into some of the habitat work that needs to happen out on the landscape to make sure that the species is recovered. Deer season is right around the corner here in the state of Kentucky. And there are many effective, safe ways to get in range of a deer, but one of the newest, most compact methods is called tree saddle hunting. Well, Shane, I know we're looking for a good tree for a saddle. I don't have any experience for this. You pick a tree out. We can use it on about any tree, uh, but that one I believe looks perfect, Chad. All right, that looks good to me. Shane, you introduced something to me that I've actually still never done, but we've talked a little about it, and that is saddle hunting. Tell me a little bit about generally what saddle hunting is, and essentially this is using a harness system in lieu of a normal traditional tree stand. Yeah, so saddle hunting is essentially it's, it's a lightweight form of hunting where you're, you're wearing a harness. It's, it's a uh, purpose-made tree saddle that's built for the purpose of a hunter spending extended periods of time in it. It's combined with a lightweight climbing method and you climb the tree and you will, you will hang suspended from a tether, which is attached to the tree, tied to your harness that you're gonna be sitting in or leaning back against, and your feet are gonna be on a small platform of some type that's gonna be attached to the tree underneath you. And literally, when you leave the ground, you're gonna be tethered to the tree where falling is not really a possibility all the way up until your hunting position. Is that correct? That's correct, yes sir. Okay, so using it in a way where you are attached and a fall is not possible is, is very, very, very important. Yeah. So the saddle system, what is the benefits of hunting with a tree saddle? It's very lightweight. It's very simple to walk in with. Instead of carrying a large stand in, it's gonna be snagging on trees and branches. You can literally wear it. You are facing the tree. It gives you more usable range around the tree to shoot from. Okay. It's very safe. You know, like you said, you're tied in from the minute you leave the ground to the minute your feet touch the ground again. When a person sees this, they're gonna immediately go, well, that kind of looks like what I see a lineman wearing or maybe a rock climber. It's very similar gear repurposed for hunting, correct? Exactly. I bet if you ask 10 different climbers how they climb and what tools they needed, you'd probably get 10 different answers. But to keep it simple, tell me exactly what equipment is needed here. A set of climbing sticks is a great way to get started. They're easy to use, they're easy to learn. You're gonna need a foot platform to put your feet on once you get up to hunting height for stability to shoot off of. You're gonna need a saddle to hold you. Attached to the saddle is gonna be a bridge. Lineman's belt to help you get up and down on the sticks. Some type of rope grab and a carabiner to attach that lineman's belt to your saddle and you're gonna need a tether. Again, some type of rope grab and a carabiner on that tether that goes around the tree that attaches to your saddle to hold you when you're suspended. So on the saddle, I step inside it, making sure I step through the bridge. There are leg loops. I'm gonna attach them. 
And this webbing, that uh, the pad, the back of the saddle, is actually what's going to be holding me as I sit I down. Gotcha. So that's where the bulk of my body's weight is going to be carried. What are they rated to hold? What kind of weight? Some of the lightest rated ones are rated around 350, 400 pounds. They'll hold plenty of weight. There's no concern there at all. So the next step for me is I'm going to take my step. This small platform will actually be what my feet will rest against when I get to hunting height. Okay. You can purchase these online as well. I made this one and tied it up. It's a step aider. A step aider essentially with you using a one step just gives you two more steps. Correct, yes. That's all this is, is it's a strap that's a two more steps to get you a little bit higher. Correct, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So I walk up to the tree and I'm gonna put it about this high. So I want my first foot to be able to reach my step aider. Okay. Throw my rope around the tree. I'm gonna attach my step to the tree using the cam cleat and the rope. Make sure the rope's ran back out of the way so I'm not gonna snag it and kick it loose with my feet. So this type of cleat, that is good right there? Yes, sir. That's rated for 500 pounds plus. It comes from the sailing industry. Okay. It'll hold It'll hold plenty of weight. Okay. I'm gonna set my stick. I'm gonna pull down on it. Okay. And then I'm gonna put my body weight into it to set it a little bit more. I'm gonna set my stick. All right. Now, the next step is to take the rope that I'm actually gonna be using. I will climb up this rope, and I will also come back down this rope by rappelling. Okay. This is a simple knot. Okay. I'm just gonna tie a simple overhand figure eight into it. And you can buy these already pre-tied. Yes, sir. You can buy them pre-tied, yep. And I'm gonna use the carabiner through the loop. I'm gonna then attach this around the tree. And you say carabiner, these are not regular carabiners you go buy at Walmart. Absolutely. They have a way that these, these will tighten back down and screw closed. Correct, yes. Don't just grab any old regular carabiner that's not made for climbing, right? Buy a climbing rated carabiner. I turned around so that my screw gate is facing out away from the tree. It's not going to get bound up against the tree. And that's going to hang for a second. Okay. So, I'm going to gather a couple of things here. I'm going to need this in a moment to descend the tree. This is a repelling ring and another carabiner. I'm going to take it and let's clip it on my belt right here. It's going to be with me going up the tree. I will need that to get down. And I'm going to use an ascender. It's a one-way rope grab. So I'm going to attach it to the rope and it grabs the rope. I gotcha. So it allows me to ascend up. I release the tension on it and I'm going to descend. Okay. okay. So at this point, my carabiner is going to attach to my ascender. That attaches to my bridge. Okay. Once you pull that tight, it's physically not possible for you to fall without a major malfunction. Correct. When I climb using an aider, I'm going to use a toe to tree method. My toe is going to touch the tree. That's what's going to lock me out and help me hold that rope steady and stable. I'm going to go ahead and start working my tether up the tree. You know, the most dangerous time is when the tether gets below your That's correct, mid point yeah. of your body, right? I mean, every time you take a step, you're pulling it up. Yes. You want to pull that up every time. Yeah, and keep it tight, yeah. So at this point, I'll sit back. I always ease into my saddle slowly at first. Okay. Let it sit, make sure my rope's good. I'm gonna hang free. All right. So at this point, my tether has me. I'm hanging in my saddle. I'm gonna reach down, grab this little wire, pull my step up, release my cam cleat. My step comes up with me. You're going to start the whole process over, it looks like. Yep, the whole process starts over. I'm going to reset my step, set it back in my cam cleat. So let me ask you something. If you were doing this and this tree had a big limb that come in right here, once you move your tether up over top of it, you could go around the limb here, couldn't you? That's correct. And in that but you're case, going to detach yourself for a split second to get above it, right? No, sir, I would not. What I would do is I would carry a second tether with me. Okay. I would tie that one, tie off to it and then I would leapfrog that tether over. I got you, okay. On a traditional stand where you're a climbing stand, you're limited to trees without limbs. Correct. With this, with a second tether, that's not a concern. That's correct, yeah. Man, that little cam lock on there is really nice because you're reaching below you. You want to make sure you got a way that you can take it off of there pretty quickly and easily, That's right? correct, uh -huh. yeah. Now, one thing we didn't showcase, you would have attached either your firearm, your muzzleloader, or your bow before you took off and had that clipped to your belt. Right. I would have that tied onto my harness. The top step of that stick is now my platform. Okay. So I've got a small rope that I would tie up here. I would hang my bow. I would pull my bow and my backpack up. Okay. Hang that here. And at this point, I've got shots. I could shoot here. I can come out on the stick shoot over here. I can come off to this side of the tree. 
and that's how I hunt. Can you turn and face the other way? Like I can. what if it was directly behind you? Yes. So now you're up there to your hunting hype. You're literally on the platform, which is your step. So on your last climb, you just don't detach it and you leave it, right? I leave it, yeah. This becomes my tether, which will become my repelling rope. So when I get up to hunting height, pull my bow up, and I'm gonna take this master rope and I'm gonna tuck it back in my backpack to keep it up. Another thing I really like about this, a deer walking under me does not see steps on the bottom of the tree. Yeah, there's literally nothing until your last step. There's no rope suspending. You've pulled everything up. So it's out of the way. Is shooting from a seated position pretty easy? I prefer to shoot from the standing position. Okay. So this is my favorite shot, is out here. Now tell me how you navigate that rope with your bowstring and your draw. Is that something? You're just over top of it. I'm up over it. Okay. So I'm gonna bring my bow out. I'm gonna come across my tether and I'm gonna draw here. Okay. So it is clear of it. So in that saddle right now, how comfortable is that for an extended four, five, six hour hunt? Oh, it's very comfortable. I could spend a long time here. All right. It's very comfortable. It's like you're sitting in a hammock against a tree. Yeah. Now, once your hunt is over, we got to come back down. There's a couple different methods you could do this. You could literally do it in reverse of the way you did this, where you could scoot your tether down a little bit, reach down, grab the step. The quickest, easiest way for you would be to do what? Simply repel out of the tree. So this is a very simple setup. This is a repelling ring. I'm simply going to run a bite of rope through this ring. And I'm gonna take a carabiner and run it through over here. And that just introduces friction to that rope. That is then gonna to attach to my bridge. There's many devices. This is a simple, easy, cheap way to do it. You can buy repelling belay devices. So anytime I do this, I always, I'm super slow and super careful from one device to another. And that's something that's just gonna take some practice. Look up on YouTube, different ways that people are doing this. Yeah. I probably wouldn't go buy the equipment and go out the very first day and climb from a tree stand. I would do most of my trial and error at about three feet, four feet off the ground. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. So if you see this knot that is behind my carabiner, this pull down rope, I'm gonna take this figure eight after I've lowered my bow and my bow's attached to the other end of it. I'm actually gonna hook this carabiner into my rope and it's gonna have a secondary function in a minute. So just like I'm repelling anywhere else, my weight's now on my rappel rope, so I'm going to always check my equipment. So I'm going to start coming down, lowering the weight a little bit. Things holding just fine. So I'm going to come down. I'm going to stop myself here, remove my step. Okay. Step's free. It'll be waiting for me at the bottom of the tree. I'm just going to come on down the tree. Just walk down the tree. There you go. And I'm down. You might look at this and go, well, wait a minute, you got a problem. Your rope is up there and you're down here, so tell us how you're gonna do this. Right, so I've got my pull down rope attached. This is where your bow is attached. It's a little yes. heavier duty than a normal bow rope. I'm simply gonna pull my rope, work it loose, and work it down the tree. There we go. There you go. Now you'd round up your ropes and your gear and shove it back into your backpack. One great thing about this, it's completely approved and safe for public lands because I can't even tell you've been on this tree literally less than a climbing stand as far as there's not a marker or scar on this tree. I think it's a great tool for a hunter to have. If you'd like to learn more information on saddle hunting, including how to use an alternate method using your climbing sticks, tune into our YouTube page at KY Afield. Hey, if you don't want to wait to deer season to hit the woods, you're in luck. Our squirrel season starts on August the 20th. Well, Jeremy, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. People are used to seeing you on, giving us all of our law enforcement information, but what they don't know is that you're an avid hunter. Oh, I love to hunt. Deer, turkey, squirrels, small game. We're right down the street from, uh, from the area that you patrol, and uh, here on the WMA, we're on Green River WMA, and you've got a squirrel dog with you today. I do. Well, let's, let's meet your dog. Okay. So how old is Soup? Soup's two. Two years old. So have you had this dog since he was a pup? We have. We got him when he was about eight months old. You just hunt squirrels and squirrels only with this dog. Right? That's it. Yeah. That's all. That's all he hunts. You, you get out and you hunt one time behind a squirrel dog, you, you'll, you'll definitely want to get you a squirrel dog. Oh, it's, it's so much fun. <laughs> Do you think he's treated? Oh, he's treated. <laughs> he's treated. <laughs> he's ready. We, we better, we better uh, get, get rolling. <laughs> hey, Dad. 
Hey, Dad, if you'll keep walking around, we see it. We're just trying to get it to move. Oh, that's going. We need a shotgun, don't we? <laughs> There's a nest right there he's trying to get to. Got him. He's coming down. He's laid back and hung up. There you go. There we go. Nice job. I'll tell you what, that, uh, that, that squirrel there uh, poses a challenge. With all the leaves, and he was pretty nervous when we came in. He oh, started yeah. moving. Yeah. And there's the second one. <laughs> oh my gosh. So the one was shot and hung up in a vine. And, and we saw a second squirrel thinking it was the first one. That's exactly right. We got two and uh, we got plenty to go. Yes, nice sir. Good job. Good work. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> this is an awesome place to, to bow hunt. I, I don't take advantage of it like I should. It's a beautiful wildlife management area, I'll tell you that. It's right up here. I think he hit it that time. Oh, he ain't dead. He's on the move. Hold it down. There you go. Oh, perfect amount of lead on that dog to keep him off there. Nice shot, Mr. McQuarrie. Look great. Nice job. Super treat, we can't remember saw it that, but we need your dad to come in and shoot it out. He had to finish it off for us, dude. We had to call in help. <laughs> we had to have backup. He got it, Good though. shot, Ned. Nice job. You know, they say it on hunting with you with the conservation officer. It can be fun, can it? Oh, yeah. It's a lot, we have a lot of fun. <laughs> you can tell he's got a passion for it. I mean, he, he, you know, the way he handles the dog. and mm -hmm. Just watching him go through the woods today, he, he's making future trips. He's planning future trips and thinking oh, yeah. about deer setups. And, right. You know, that's what it takes to be a good a good game officer. You I think have so. To, you have to know what what's what's a hunter going to be out here looking for. What, where are they going to yeah. want to set up? And you know, and you, most of our conservation officers, matter of fact, I don't know any that don't hunt. Yeah. They, they all want to spend time outdoors. That's why they became a conservation right. officer. Got him. That's a sale one. Get our game bag in within our game bag out. <laughs> <laughs> Keep things from getting so messy anyway. Good job. It's been pretty fast paced as far as treating yeah, goes. Oh my God. I, I, I will bet my boat that when you turn her loose within three minutes, she's treated. <laughs> it's going to happen again, huh? Good job, buddy. Good job. Tell me a little bit about how these dogs hunt differently. Uh, than the, the difference mostly between this dog, the Mountain Cur, and, and the Feist is. Feist are most of the time going to use their eyes. They're going to focus mainly on tree and squirrels mm -hmm. by sight. And Soup, like I said, he's an original mountain cur. He'll use his eyes some, but it's mainly going to be his nose. Okay. Better reload, huh? Get ready. I think so. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, go ahead, buddy. If you got a good shot. I can't mm -hmm. find his head. Right. He is little. Oh, you me to. Yeah, you got him. Uh oh, he's starting to run. Yeah, he's on the other side of the street. There he comes. Nice shot. That's teamwork. This is something you can do by yourself, but it's a lot more fun when you got somebody to talk to and carry on with. And a lot of times, it takes someone running around the tree to get a good, clear it, shot. It truly is what you said. It does take teamwork with the dog. And the hunters. Yeah, exactly. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have Cade Carter and Briggs Bates with a beautiful smallmouth bass that was caught on Cave Run Lake. Here we have 12-year-old Tori Williams. It's her first time fishing at her uncle's secret spot in Oldham County. Nice fish. Check out this bass caught by Amelia Allen. This fish was caught in Martin County, Kentucky. Nice job. 
Here we have Jennifer Lovins. She caught this beautiful five pound largemouth bass in Owen County, Kentucky. Nice fish. Here we have Joe Ortlieb and John Martini with a nice group of ducks from Campbell County. Nice job. Hunter Ward here caught this beautiful black crappie at a farm pond while fishing with his papa in Clark County, Kentucky. Karen Richardson would like to thank her time at the Becoming an Outdoor Woman weekend for this catfish she caught while fishing with her husband on Gist Creek Lake. Just a reminder, Kentucky Field will be off air and preempted on KET for the next two weeks. But make sure you join us live on August the 27th for our annual Kentucky Wild Questions and Answers Show. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next time, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.